Good morning, Michigan community. We are excited to welcome you all to our third annual Juneteenth celebration. My name is Herbert Winfield. I'm a professor in the electrical engineering and computer science department, uh, popularly known as EECS, and I'll be your MC for this event. This year's event is part of the university-wide Juneteenth Symposium, whose theme is to celebrate, educate, and inspire. In our X event, we celebrate black engineers and scientists who are making a difference, who will educate us about their work and who will serve as inspiration for all of us. And in particular, for young black students who aspire to careers in science and engineering. We hope this event will play a part in creating positive change within the department, the College of Engineering, and the University of Michigan. This X event was organized in partnership with the Graduate Society of Black Engineers and Scientists, and we are grateful for their efforts. Juneteenth, uh, really the second, the country's second Independence Day is a time for celebration and community where we honor black history and culture. However, we would be remiss not to acknowledge recent events that are a source of great pain and anxiety for many. It is a challenging time marked by mass shootings from Buffalo to Uvalde and beyond. Harmful legislation targeting our most vulnerable communities, a never ending global pandemic and more. June is also LGBTQ plus Pride Month. And we note in particular the epidemic of violence against black trans women that has only worsened in recent years. Throughout our program today, we encourage you to remember that intersectionality is key to addressing all forms of discrimination and oppression. We do have an exciting program for you today. And to begin, we are pleased to present Michigan's Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist, who graduated from the University of Michigan in 2005 with a bachelor's in computer science and engineering. Happy Juneteenth, everyone. Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist here. Thank you for letting me join you at the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department's Juneteenth celebration. It's great to be back, and of course, go blue. Today, we recognize Juneteenth, a day of celebration and freedom. We celebrate and elevate Black Americans and their stories of triumph against oppression and victory over hate. This Juneteenth, let us reflect on the meaning of the freedoms we cherish and recommit ourselves to following in the footsteps of so many courageous people who marched and organized to create a more perfect union. Governor Whitmer and I are committed to building a more equitable and just Michigan. We've put equity at the center of all the work we have done. Whether it's closing the funding gap between schools so every kid in every district gets the same amount of resources from the state, investing in healthcare access to boost outcomes in marginalized communities, or enacting historic criminal justice reforms, we will work with anyone to invest in Michiganders and create real change. We will strive to create a Michigan we can be proud to pass on to future generations. And we hope that you will join us in standing tall for justice and equality for every Michigander. Thank you once again to the University of Michigan's Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. Go blue and happy Juneteenth. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Gov Governor Gavin Gilchrist. We would now like to invite you to listen to performance of Lift Every Voice and Sing, the Black National Anthem. Singing today, uh, EECS alum, David Tarver, Terrence McQueen, a graduate of the School of Education, and Kayla Hill Odera, a graduate of the School of Music, Theater, and Dance. And I'll be providing the piano accompaniment.
Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmony of liberty Let our rejoicing rise Let it resound loud as the rolling seas. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun of a new day begun let us march on till victory is won stony the chastening rod felt in the days when hope unborn had died yet with the steady beat hath not our weary feet come to the place for which our Father's side We have come over a way that with tears has been watered We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered out from the gloomy past Till now we stand at last Where the white gleam of our bright star is cast God of our weary years God of our soul I'd now like to introduce Amber Abram and Brittany Hicks, who will give us a brief history of Juneteenth. Juneteenth might not be familiar to everyone, so I'd like to share the history behind this celebration. Juneteenth is the oldest nationally celebrated commemoration of the ending of slavery in the United States. 
The first enslaved Africans were brought to the English colony of Jamestown, Virginia in 1619. The U.S. Congress officially outlawed the African slave trade in 1808, but the domestic trade grew. And by 1860, there were nearly 4 million people enslaved in America, with most of them living in cotton producing Southern states. On September 22, 1862, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing all enslaved people in America. However, the Civil War was in full swing and the Southern states refused to acknowledge or comply with this proclamation. After the Civil War ended in 1865, soldiers landed in Galveston, Texas, one of the most remote of the slave states, bringing news that the war had ended and that the enslaved were now free. They delivered the news on June 19, 1865, a date which later became known as Juneteenth. The 13th Amendment, which officially ended slavery and protected against any legal challenges to the presidential order, was ratified later that year. Juneteenth has been celebrated by the African American community ever since, but it was only recently recognized as an official federal holiday. Today, Juneteenth celebrates African American freedom and achievement with the goal of promoting and cultivating knowledge and appreciation of African American history and culture. Thank you. Now to help commemorate the day, we have an abridged and somewhat rearranged reading of the Emancipation Proclamation. This will be presented by Emma Dodu, Asia Kroski, and Onyinye Mwanko. By the President of the United States of America, a short and proclamation that on the first day of January in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves with any state or designated part of the state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States shall be then and thenceforward and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and the naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in efforts that they may make for their actual freedom. That the executive will on the first day of January aforesaid by proclamation designate the states and parts of states, if any, in which the people thereof respectively shall then be in rebellion against the United States. And the fact that any state or the people thereof shall on that day be in good faith represented in the Congress of the United States by members chosen thereto at elections wherein a majority of the qualified voters of such state shall have participated, shall, in the absence of strong countervailing testimony, be deemed conclusive evidence that such state and the people thereof are not then in rebellion against the United States. And I hereby enjoin upon the people so declared to be free to abstain from all violence unless in necessary self-defense. And I recommend to them that in all cases, when allowed, they labor faithfully for reasonable wages. And I further declare and make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. And upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice, warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of the Almighty God. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed, done at the city of Washington this first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1000. 863 and of the independence of the United States of America, the 87th, by the President Abraham Lincoln, William H. Seward, Secretary of State. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, Asia, 
and Onyinye for sharing that historic moment with us. We now come to the core of our program, a symposium featuring some of our most distinguished EECS and Applied Physics PhD alumni. The format will be as follows. We will have the, the four of them make their presentations, each one lasting about 12 or 13 minutes. After each presentation, there'll be time for one or two questions. Questions can be placed in the Q&A function. Comments from the audience can be submitted via chat. At the end of all four presentations, there'll be an open forum, a panel involving our four distinguished guests. So let me introduce the four panelists. They are Dr. Angelique Johnson, founder and CEO of MemSTEM LLC, Dr. James Mickens, the Gordon McKay Professor of Computer Science at, the, in, at Harvard University, and Dr. Donald Walton, Director, Corning Technology Center, Silicon Valley. And then at the end will be Dr. Todd Coleman, Associate Professor in the Department of Bioengineering and Electrical Engineering at Stanford University. So let me say a few words about Dr. Johnson. Uh, she did her undergraduate work at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and received her PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Michigan in 2011. That same year, she founded the company MemSTEM to translate her doctoral research in cochlear implants into commercial products. Right away, she took top honors and prize money in the Michigan Business Challenge. Since then, she has received many patents and has raised millions in competitive small business innovation research or SBIR grants from NIH or from the NSF. She has testified between the Small Business Committee of the US House of Representatives and spoken before numerous organizations. Combining her passion and her expertise in the areas of innovation and entrepreneurship, Dr. Johnson recently founded Visionarium an organization that promotes, trains, and equips underserved entrepreneurs to achieve their God-given visions. Dr. Johnson, please, the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you for that um, very kind introduction. Uh, I thought it would be helpful for me to kind of just share a video um, that uh, kind of is a summary of, of the work that I'm doing. And give me one moment. It's like and sometimes I always say to say pictures worth a thousand words, well, a video is worth a million. And, and this video will, will much clearly explain more clearly explain what I'm doing than I will in a moment. <laughs> okay, so this is more what I would expect in there. I'm Dr. Angelique Johnson and I'm electrical and biomedical engineer. We're not getting metal in the contact area. I have five brothers and five sisters, so that's 11 of us, including myself. And my dad was a chemical engineer. My mom, she was a mathematician. Probably when I was in, I believe, first grade, my mom decided to homeschool everybody. So she raised us heavily in science and technology. There was lots of brain teasers, even in the off time. <laughs> I was really passionate about wanting to work on something that I could see helping individuals in the next three to five years. I had no experience with cochlear implants. I didn't have anybody in my family that with death or heart appearing at that time. A cochlear implant is, for lack of a better term, an implantable hearing aid. It's for individuals who can't get any benefit from just amplifying the sound. The actual cells that send electrical stimulus to the brain are dead. A cochlear implant has the stimulator, which generates this current, and it's implanted in the skull. And then the array is through that spiral-shaped bone called the cochlea. 
When I graduated, I was like, what do I want to do to actually live my life? And what am I willing to sacrifice to live the life that I want? Spend the resist. I just saw that having my own company was the way to be independent. Okay. Engineering requires a lot of creativity, and the inspiration doesn't just come from being in the lab and from a textbook. I do praise dance at church. I love fashion. I love design. And so that ties into product design and how we choose to design our technology. I am really excited about the idea of having created a scientific innovation from concept all the way to fruition. We haven't gotten there yet in terms of having our technology be accessible to the clinical market, but we're well on our road there. And I'm excited by the, the hope and the vision that we will be there. Good would be seeing more of that metal everywhere. Okay, wonderful. So um, that really just gives, you know, a snapshot of what it is that uh, I'm doing at my company and, um, you know, a little bit of my background in terms of where I grew up and, and my experience, which is uh, different <laughs> from than most. And, you know, all of that really led up to me starting and forming my company MemSTEM. And this company really came out of the research that I was doing at University of Michigan. I was at that time working at cochlear implants, but really the same technology can be used in many different areas of the body uh, and uh, what you call uh, neurostimulators. So it can be used for hearing loss in the cochlear implant example, but also for chronic pain and spinal cord stimulators. It can be used um, as a vagus nerve stimulator. Uh, for severe migraines or Parkinson's um, tremors can be treated with deep brain stimulators. When we were doing, when I was doing my research at University of Michigan um, with the cochlear implant, we were just focusing on this electrode part of it for the most part. But, you know, we were really trying to get around the issues of hand assembly of that technology. And because the hand assembly is so tedious, you have to do it by hand under a microscope, it really has a lot of drawbacks. It's costly, it's limiting the size of the technology, it can hamper innovation, and it really blocks emerging markets from getting into the space. There are many um, countries around the world that don't even have access to the technology because of the price point. When we think about, um, even we're thinking about uh, different markets in India, um, different uh, markets in China, they're doing big pushes in this area for cochlear implants. But again, it's not just cochlear implants, it's all these technologies. If you wanna get this technology um, in many countries in Africa, they have to, you know, South Africa kind of becomes a hotbed for it. People have to travel long distances. Um, and so really it's trying to get the technology across the world by reducing these barriers. What we can do through automation is we can address all those issues. We can lower the costs. We can accelerate the product life cycles. Um, we can tap into those emerging markets. However, my journey at the University of Michigan was very much so focused on kind of what I say, making the sexy technology. So uh, focusing primarily on the lead, but also I did a custom ASIC that I designed myself. Uh, and really we worked with other partners to do a stimulator system. And it was a complete system where we were in the, um, at that time, it was called WIMS, you know, wireless micro uh, electromechanical systems, and doing all kinds of crazy things, putting rings on the back of the arrays, uh, making really small electrodes so you get more, many more of them on there. We were shooting for 128 electro device, so more electrodes was supposed to correspond to more um, higher sound resolution. We were curling the devices so they curved around the cochlea, and again, making custom ASICs. So we're doing a lot of great stuff. And not only were we making it, but we were doing animal studies to show that it was great and um, that it, it worked. Uh, we were getting great results in our animal studies with guinea pigs. But I came to the end of my dissertation and I realized all the research was wonderful, but um, I don't know, how do, how do we get this into the market? How do people ultimately end up using the technology that we make in the university? And pitch competitions, as uh, Professor Winfield mentioned, was the way to go. 
So I partnered with two MBA students. Um, MBA school, I was at El Lori Institute, was really big on connecting engineers with MBA students. And so you do these competitions. Um, it wasn't really all the time that people would form an actual company, but it was an exercise to see could a company be formed um, and to you know get learn some of that business stuff to make that happen. So I did wonderful in the competitions, one not only in Michigan, but one uh, different competitions around the, the uh, state. So it was a great time. And I thought, well, we won these competitions and we're ready. So let's go to our customers. Advanced Bionics is a big producer of cochlear implants. And we're like, let's go to them. We flew out to California um, to meet with them. And we were excited uh, and thought, hey, well, this is it. And we were um, quickly <laughs> reminded that as wonderful as research can be, as wonderful as your technology can be, uh, you oftentimes we do not design with the FDA in mind. We design to make, as I showed you earlier, you know, the most complicated, wonderful, um, high performing devices, but we don't, especially in the medical field, think about, well, how do we put this in a human body and how do we address all the concerns that the FDA would want us to address, which are not just FDA concerns, but they're human concerns, right? We want people to be safe using our technology and we certainly want it to last for longer than um, even the dissertation, right? So sometimes we get enough data and we say we're done with the device. Well, it doesn't work like that in the human body. And I quickly, you know, really became fully aware of that. Um, something we know, but it's not something you experience until you get out there and you form a company. So instead of innovating for publications, um, innovating, you know, uh, because it's, you know, it, it brings you fame in the academic world, we shifted gears and we said, let's innovate on demand. So let's only make an innovation if it's, demanded um, and necessary so that we can provide a true human impact solution. And that caused us to start doing things I had never done at the university level, um, which was think a little bit more outside the box um, in terms of how do we combine the best of what people are, what works in the human body and shown to work in the human body with the best of what technology we have at the university level, right? Or these sophisticated labs and see what we get. And through a lot of trial and error, we were doing molded, you know, platinum plating inside silicone molds, and which we wasn't really done. We were putting our devices in curved molds. We were elongating silicone sheets and vapor depositing metal on top of it to create waves so it could be elastic. We're doing all this stuff. And ultimately what, what we discovered was the best way for us was if we could just build up the device, we could just print it in one shot, and not have to worry about toxic chemicals that the body doesn't like, right? Uh, not have to worry about expensive tool sets that industry is not going to adopt and really just reduce the tool set as well as improve the performance. That was what we were shooting for. And so we ended up doing a 3D printed solution, which you know resulted in elastic metals that we create in-house, um, plastic elastic metals safe for medical use. And to kind of summarize where we're at, we started in the laboratory. I started there as my dissertation and I'm walking the road to this pilot plant, which is a totally new tool set, new intellectual property, and ultimately wanting to end in this commercial manufacturing space, wanting to be an OEM to medical device companies like Medtronic and Boston Scientific, where they can you know, get on the phone with us, call us up, we can meet with them and strategize a design and then produce that design for them with our 3D printer system. So I you know, always say that, um, you know, it's best if you can think like an innovator, but you can act like an entrepreneur. And entrepreneurs have to think not only about um, how wonderful the innovation is, but they're more so focused on, will the marketplace be able to afford it? Will I be able to, you know, put in the price point of my customers? Will we be able to scale it up in a real manufacturing facility? All these things that entrepreneurs think of, so um, that act like. And so I say, think like an innovator and act like an entrepreneur. And uh, thank you for your time today. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson. Now I have one quick question for you. Okay. Uh, you know, most professors at the university, when they are training graduate students, they're thinking about essentially reproducing themselves, uh, training graduate students to become either faculty or maybe to go into industry or get a job in industry. Uh, did you have any mentorship related to like forming your own company? 
Yeah. yeah. So I, my advisor was Dr. Kenzo Wise, and he was a part of several companies, but um, he was he was very much so a true academic, and he was really great in that. He said, "Hey, I'll you know I'll help you in any way, shape, or form." So that he was a great partner in that way. Um, but I would say most of my advising came from the Zell Lori Institute, uh, which is a wonderful institute over on the house, primarily on the business school campus. And they really were great because I knew how to think like an engineer, right? To think like an innovator, but I didn't know how to act like an entrepreneur. And the business school was full of entrepreneurs and people that had classes for that, people that would train you, give you one-on-one -on -one counseling and coaching and tear apart your business plan and build it back up with you. And that was really how I learned um, the business side of things. Um, and then combined it, came back to the engineering campus and combined it all together. I also noticed that even though you started here in Ann Arbor, the company, you moved to Louisville, Kentucky. Is there a reason for that? Yeah. So when we're starting a company, you kind of got to go where the money is at. And at that time, when I moved, and they still have it somewhat now, they would match your SBIR funds up to a certain dollar amount if you moved your company to Kentucky. So if you had a phase one, they would match it up to 150000 If you had a phase two, they would match it up to a million dollars. Um, now they've kind of decreased that amount. But one of the stipulations is you have to move your company to Kentucky. 51% uh, of your employees have to be Kentucky residents. Uh, your headquarters have to be physically based in Kentucky um, and all uh, those other such requirements. So that's how we ended up here in Kentucky, which is a good place to be because of cost of living. So it's cheaper for a startup to get going. Um, there's a bit of a brain drain here. So recruiting talent is rough, <laughs> but uh, but we came, yeah, we came for the money. <laughs> okay, so you followed the money. Good. Yes. Um, let me check this. Uh, Dr. Johnson, we had uh, one question in the Q&A. Um, Everardo is wondering how you were able to acquire funding um, so early on in your process to scale up. So we went the SBIR route. Now, I will say when I was pitching competitions, I got investors that wanted to invest. In fact, some of them were very aggressive about wanting to invest. At that time, I hadn't fully intended, right? It was kind of more of an entrepreneurial exercise. I wasn't sure if was I actually going to bring this company forward and, you know, was this a life that I was going to enter into? And so at the time, you know, I kind of turned down those investors. But when I did come back to the company, um, it was around 2014, that I came back to the company and I realized, well, we had done customer discovery through the i program. And we'd realized that we just, we needed to re-innovate in terms of the manufacturing materials and SBIRs are a great way to build those innovations out and prove out a newer technology so that then you can go back to the investors when you have something proven out, but also when you're a little bit further along, so you can maintain a little bit more of your company at that stage, and you've already built the culture of your company. So it's a great opportunity to take advantage of if you can. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions in Q&A? We have just one more. Um, I was wondering, uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, you talked a little bit about your time at Michigan with Dr. Weiss and all that, and that's amazing. I'm curious if you have any advice for current students of the types of resources here um, that you would really, uh, you either wish you'd taken more advantage of, or you think um, could be a good way for students to kind of get on the same sort of track if they're interested with that sort of thing. Yeah, it's, it, I would say do not, if you're at all thinking about entrepreneurship, I don't, again, I had not intended on starting a company. It was just an exercise. I highly encourage you to um, definitely go to the Del Lori Institute and take advantage of all their programming. They have pitch competitions. They have courses that you can take even as an engineering student. Um, and then the engineering campus, I don't know if they still have it, but I believe they actually have a master's in business and engineering, like a combined degree. So you, on the engineering campus, I actually had other courses that I was able to take advantage of that were specific to entrepreneurship. A course that taught about ownership, founder ownership, and you know, navigating that. And so there were um, great courses on both campuses. So Michigan is a, a very powerful university to be a part of if you're looking to be an entrepreneur. And I've dealt with a lot of universities and Michigan is unique in this. So I say take advantage of any seminars, any pitch competitions, um, audit any courses you can, um, get to know the entrepreneurs at the business school and the entrepreneurs in the College of Engineering and take advantage of that mentorship. 
Uh, Wonderful. We, Thank you. And we just have one more question. I think um, her, this can be the last one if you want to move on. Um, sure. But Everard, I was also wondering, um, so first of all, congratulations to Everard, who says they just had their first kid a few days ago. Um, and so they're wondering uh, how you were able to balance the sort of work-life balance uh, with entrepreneurship um, and if and you had any advice. Yeah, you know, um, I do a lot of business coaching. I myself um, and not married with kids, but I do a lot of business coaching and mentoring of individuals that are. And my biggest piece of advice to them is to realize that every business is a family business. And so um, you oftentimes one partner will have a business and the other partner feel, well, that's your thing. Or the partner might be like, this is my thing. Um, or they might be like, well, we're not gonna involve our kids, but there's no way not to. Um, even when you have babies, they are involved in your business because there's certain sacrifices and things you have to do for your business that affect them. And so I think the sooner that you make it a family business or everybody is partnering together and doing their part in whatever way that could be, um, you know, I think that that's the best way to balance it. That way you don't separate your business, your entrepreneurial business from your family life entirely. And it doesn't become this struggle and dynamic, which I see a lot of founders go through when they try to compartmentalize it because you go home at night and you think about your business, you want the person laying next to you to be able to have conversations with them about that and not feel like that's off limits. Uh, thank you. That's some really great advice uh, for would-be entrepreneurs. Now, I should mention that after all four presentations, there'll still be time for more questions. Uh, Dr. Johnson will be part of a panel. And so we can ask her more questions then too. Okay, thank you very much to Johnson. Okay, we're now going to move to our second speaker, uh, Dr. James Mickens. Dr. James Mickens earned his PhD in computer science and engineering at the University of Michigan in 2008. After six years at Microsoft and a visiting professorship at MIT, he joined the computer science department at Harvard in 2015, perhaps because he owned a t-shirt that said, Harvard, the Michigan of the East. Uh, he was promoted from associate to full professor and granted tenure in 2019, whereupon he was transformed into a magnificent supernova composed of pure tenure particles. Now that's from his website. Uh, back on earth, Professor Mickens has made such fundamental and amazing contributions to computer science and life that he long ago ran out of storage space for his awards. You will find his wit and wisdom captured in numerous YouTube videos of his keynote speeches at countless important computer conferences. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present Professor James Mickens from Harvard University. Thanks for that uh, great introduction. Let me uh, share my slides here. Let's see. Okay, so I think they should be uh, showing up now. Great. So, uh, yes. The rumors are true. My name is James Mickens, and I am happy to be here with you all today. Now, Herb told me that I could talk about uh, whatever I wanted, so I decided to uh, provide some of my reflections on life in the universe. Uh, then Herb told me that I only had 12 minutes to talk, so I'll just focus this talk on my particular life and the part of the universe that includes my life. Nonetheless, I think that you'll be impressed by both the breadth and the depth of the presentation today. So here's the outline. First, we'll briefly go over the topic of who is James Mickens, a question that has been posed across the millennia. Then I'll give you a brief uh, overview of what does James Mickens research. Uh, and then finally, I'll conclude with uh, some advice that I have for students and really uh, just general humanity, all people who walk the earth. So let's first start on the topic of uh, James Mickens. As uh, Herb mentioned, I, uh, I grew up in Atlanta. I went to Georgia Tech to get a bachelor's uh, degree in computer science. Then I decided to learn what uh, the snow was all about. So I went to the University of Michigan, go blue right here. And then I got my PhD 
uh, in computer science. So I uh, spent, you know, in years as a PhD student where n is greater than two and less than 15. We don't need to dwell about exactly how long it took me. So after I experienced the uh, snow of Michigan, I decided to uh, experience rain. So then I went out to Seattle uh, and I worked at Microsoft Research in the distributed systems group. And then after that, uh, after about uh, six or seven years there, I decided to come back to academia. And so now I'm a professor of computer science uh, at Harvard University. So at a high level, what kind of stuff uh, do I investigate there? Well, I do things like look at efficient failure recovery uh, techniques for software so that they can still continue to make uh, forward progress when there are failures. I look at things like technologies for allowing data centers uh, to respect user privacy. In other words, to uh, not look at sensitive user data if the user doesn't want the data center to see that. Uh, I also look at things like better antivirus scanners. You know, despite our best intentions, sometimes we click on something we shouldn't have clicked on. And so I look into technology to try to uh, identify those computational threats. So why do I show these particular papers to you? Obviously, you should cite these papers. The only way I'm going to get the Nobel Prize is if my H index goes up. So find a way to make those papers relevant to you. It's good for me. It's good for society. And it'll be good once I get that uh, Nobel Prize award money. Anyways, moving on. Uh, now we're going to look in a little bit more depth at uh, what I research. I gave you a flavor of it, but now we're going to do a little bit more of a deep dive into one topic that I find particularly uh, interesting. So uh, as a preface, have you heard about the web? The World Wide Web. It's an exciting technology. You can go to sites like this one. It's the world's finest online poker site. It has to be. It says it right there. You can't lie on the internet. You can go to this site, uh, definitely.com. If you're ever worried about how to spell definitely, well, this site will tell you. Uh, you do have to be able to spell definitely correctly to get to the actual URL. But, you know, I leave that as an exercise uh, to the reader. Look at that. It's a fun ad. Five things to know if you use cotton swabs. So for example, if you use cotton swabs, a strange person might show up at your house and demand to look in your ear. Here's another great one. 15 states. I saw this ad yesterday. 15 states where Americans don't want to live anymore. I'm guessing that the states are any state that is ruled by furry dinosaurs. I'm not a dinosaur scientist, so I can't say that with uh, great confidence. But anyways, these are the kinds of things that we see on the web. And so I want all of these uh, web pages to load quickly. That's been a focus of a lot of my research over the last couple of years. How do we make web pages load quickly? And I got interested in this because of first person experience or frustration, I should say, with trying to load web pages. We've all been in the situation where we're at the coffee shop, we're drinking our frappuccino, we uh, try to load a web page, and we're just waiting, and we're waiting, and this thing is spinning, and it's spinning, and at some point, we just become old people. That's the number one cause of becoming old. You're waiting for your web pages to load. So I want my research to address this problem. I want to figure out how to make web pages load more quickly. But before we can optimize something, we have to understand it. So what happens when a browser uh, loads a web page? So I'm going to uh, explain a little bit about how this works. Uh, we're going to get very slightly technical, OK? But don't worry, mate. You're with the perfect guide right here, OK? Just slowly approach the technicals, all right? You're going to be fine. So let's do sort of like a medium level dive into how does a browser load a web page. So let's imagine you've got your, uh, your phone off to the left, and you want to load some website, foo.com. So now let's imagine you've got a web server over to the right. So you hit enter. You know, you want to load the web page. Your phone's going to send out a request, a web request to the uh, web server. And then the web server is going to return what's known as HTML. So if you look inside the HTML, here's sort of a simplified view of what you see in there. And at a high level, the take home point is that we see these tags, this link tag, a script tag, an image tag, so on and so forth. And we see that many of these tags are associated with external resources. So here's like a JavaScript file or an image that has to be fetched. So uh, that HTML goes up uh, to the browser. And then the browser starts to display the initial content in the page. But note that the HTML, as I referenced, uh, it contains tags that in turn reference external objects. So to fully load the page, the browser has to fetch all of these external objects that are mentioned by those tags. So for example, the browser sends out a request to get a CSS 
object. At a high level, a CSS object uh, changes the visual appearance of the page. So the browser takes that CSS object that's been fetched and then, for example, changes uh, the coloration of some part of the page. The browser might then go off and get that JavaScript file. JavaScript files just contain code. OK, so when the browser gets that piece of code, it might see something like this. The details aren't super important, but basically what's happening here is that that code is saying, if the user is logged in, I want to fetch some personalized uh, image, right? Otherwise, I'm just going to uh, fetch some default image, right? So if we imagine that the if body is taken, in other words, if the user is actually logged in, then we send the request out and we get some a custom avatar. So that's the avatar of me because in this example, I'm logged in. So the browser takes that image and then updates uh, the page to now include that custom image. Now let's imagine that the else body was taken. Okay, so we check to see if the user was logged in. The answer was no. So now we're going down this branch of the code. So in this case, we get some default avatar. Now, in this case, it's a, a picture of a moss covered rock. That's an interesting choice for a default avatar. This website's not going to do well, but you know, we'll let the market decide. So in this case, if we take the else branch, we see that this default avatar image gets displayed over there. So what's what's the high level point? The high level point is that a single page load may be associated with many potential universes for each user. A universe is just a, a variant of the page. So in the previous example, depending on if I've been logged in or not, I might get a different version of the page. Now, if you wanna see more details about this whole notion of many potential universes, I recommend you check out the scientific documentary, Spider-Man No Way Home. It's a tour de force of technical uh, enumeration, but we're not gonna dwell on that today. Instead, we're just gonna look at this simple example that I showed you here. There were these two possible universes for a single web page, depending on if I was logged in or not. And so what we note here is that the universe that a user sees is determined by the decisions that a browser makes during a page load. And those decisions may examine personalized state. So um, like, am I logged in or not? That blue text that I showed you. And it may fetch personalized content. So like in this example, that, uh, that customized avatar picture. OK, so what if a browser could predict which universe a particular user needs? Well, that would be pretty neat, because then the browser could fetch all of the universe's objects at once. So what I mean by that is, let's first consider today's world. As I've showed you before, the browser sends over a request, receives a particular object. Then it has to send over another request, get another object. And this continues back and forth. And we see that in this particular example, that's going to result in the page loading in four time units. But remember, the goal is to make the page load more quickly. So if we think about the James Mickens amazing future world of tomorrow, note that's trademarked and copyright. Don't try to steal that name. I will sue you. I'm very litigious. So in this amazing future world, if the browser could predict which universe uh, a user will need, the browser will just say to the web server, hey, give me all the objects associated with that particular universe. And then the web server can just return all of those objects at once. And so in this world, a page loads in one time unit. And that's great, right? So you might wonder, but how can we predict which universe a user will need? Well, you know, a lesser person would say, let's just give up. OK, and that's what I might do if I were a Yale professor. But of course, uh, I'm a Harvard professor and Harvard only produces excellence, uh, except for that guy and also except for that guy. But besides that, also, that's that's Jim Cramer there. I see you've backed me into a conversational corner. We're going to move very quickly. I elude the trap. So what is my research? So my research at a high level basically says, well, before a page is loaded, we want to generate a tree of all possible universes. So like we might say, OK, well, there's some JavaScript code in the page. There's the decision here that's made based on whether the user is logged in. So if the user is not logged in, we'll figure out, well, the user needs that universe. Otherwise, if the user is logged in, maybe there's some other decision that has to be made about the user's phone type, for example. Is it an Android or is it an iPhone? If the answer is yes, then we'll say, ah, the user uh, is uh, trying to load the page from a phone. If the answer is no, we might say, oh, well, the user is trying to uh, load the page from a non-phone, like a desktop device. 
So we generate a tree of all these possible universes ahead of time. Uh, for the computer scientists out there, we use a technique called symbolic execution to do that. But anyways, once we have that tree, we then say, okay, well, during a page load, what the user's browser is going to do is it's going to go down the tree. It's going to traverse the tree, making decisions by consulting a user's personal information. So imagine uh, that we have a user with a phone up here, and it has the following personal information. The user is logged in, their username is James Mickens, and the phone type is Android. So we hit that first diamond up here. Uh, we see that I am logged in. So then we go down that leftmost pass in the tree. Then we see that my phone type is Android. So we go down that leftmost pass in the tree again. And so now what we've figured out is this is the universe of things that I need. And so later on, uh, when my browser actually has to load the page, what does it do? Well, it sends over a request for this universe over here, and the web server sends back all the necessary objects uh, all at once, leading to the page loading in one time unit. So that's a high level overview of uh, some of the research that I'm most excited about. I'd be glad to talk about it more in the Q&A. So uh, in the remaining uh, two minutes that I have, let me just share a bit of advice uh, for students and for uh, everyone out there who walks the earth. So as I've established, uh, I'm an engineer. Uh, I like designing things. I like building things. But I should say that in my first two years in college, I was living what I would say is my best worst life. So I was just in the computer lab all the time, drinking Red Bull, just coding all hours of the day. And that's all that I wanted to do. I just wanted to code. Now, you might say, oh, look at this, this full head of hair here. What happened? Don't forget, I shaved my hair. I'm not bald. In fact, this is a picture of me from back in the day. The 70s were a heck of a time. A lot of fun things were happening there. Once again, I digress. So anyway, so I was really focused on engineering as an undergraduate. Um, but then I took a philosophy class, and I started learning questions like, who and what has moral standing? These are things that we can ask even if we're engineers. We can ask questions like, how do we define what is right and what is wrong? This is all relevant when we're thinking as engineers about what we want to build. Uh, because as it turns out, most of the systems that we build as engineers, they are socio-technical systems that will interact with people. So these questions about who and what has moral standing and how do we define right and wrong, that's very important. And the philosophy class really opened my eyes to that. It also opened to my, my eyes to this question, are we just brains and vats whose sensory experiences are a cruel illusion? If you've got more questions about that, I direct you to the delightful Wikipedia article, Brain and a Vat. And in fact, that's what we see off over here. Don't forget, uh, Wikipedia uh, is never wrong. So anyway, so I started thinking about all these things in a philosophy class. And so I really, looking back, am glad that I took that class because it taught me this important lesson that tech work is not value neutral work. And that's one thing that I always try to tell to my students. You know, even if you think you're working in theory or at a low level of engineering, uh, it's really important to think about the fact that the things that you build uh, are going to go out into the world. So uh, you should really uh, keep that in mind when you're building things. And sort of a corollary lesson here is that you as an engineer should learn about stuff outside of pure engineering. So that's lesson one, tech work is not value neutral work. Uh, lesson two, uh, if you ever appear in a court case, try to select the courtroom sketch artist. Uh, I learned this the hard way. So I was an expert witness in the Epic versus Apple trial. And here's how the courtroom sketch artist depicted me. Look at that right there. Let's just zoom in on that face of woe. Uh, let me tell you something. If you think that you're my friend, and if I actually look like a mole man, you got to tell me that. Okay, you got to tell me I need to change my exercise routine, my vitamins, everything that I'm doing. Clearly, it's not working. Then the third lesson uh, that I'll conclude with is that it's really important to build a supportive community. So this is really a lesson for a lot of the students out there. Um, but this is a lesson even for people who are out there as adults and who are practitioners. If we look at time on the x-axis and the excitement about a paper that you're writing on the y-axis, then you start off by saying, oh, this paper is okay. You know, it's not bad. It's okay. Then you start working on it and you say, this paper is amazing. But then, of course, uh, you submit it and sometimes your paper gets rejected. And then you say, well, everything I learned turns to ash, right? And so this is a sort of cycle that you see um, with a lot of people, particularly students. And so it's important to keep in mind that in academia, in life in general, other people's failures are often invisible to you. So I'll reveal some of my failures uh, right now. Hard to believe. I know that I have failures, but it's true. So for example, these two papers here, 
We submitted them, they had zero rejections. They got in the first time. This paper had one rejection, okay? That's still not too bad. Now this paper had six rejections. We submitted it to uh, six different venues before it finally got accepted, right? And that was tough, but it did eventually get accepted. And in fact, it later uh, became a best paper award uh, at SOC 2019. So this is all along with the way of saying, this is why it's important to build a supportive community. This is particularly important if you're a student. You gotta keep in mind, you're not the only one who has papers that get rejected. You're not the only one who occasionally says something incorrect during a meeting. Uh, you're not the only one who isn't sure which career path is the best one. So a strong support group is important. You should talk to other students, even in other departments. You should make time to not do work. You should guard your, uh, your free time. It's important for mental health. And you shouldn't be afraid to talk to mental health professionals. And so I'll close with this picture here. This is a picture of uh, the research group that I had at uh, uh, University of Michigan. So we were all lab mates. Uh, back when I was a grad student, and we all happened to run into each other at a workshop. Uh, and it was just, a, I really love this photo because it shows to me the importance of community. You know, we've stayed in touch over the years, um, and it's just really nice to uh, have a bunch of folks that you can sort of rely on uh, when things get tough, because things will get tough. Now, some of you might notice here that it seems like there's a decreasing height gradient here, and that you know I seem to be the shortest one in the photo. That's just fake news. It's just an optical illusion, the way the camera was aligned, the position of the sun with respect to Mercury and Saturn. Anyway, it involves physics. We can talk about that later. I'm quite tall. Anyways, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for the uh, invitation to Herb. Uh, I'm really uh, grateful for all the uh, great mentoring in education I got at the University of Michigan, so I'm glad to be here for this Juneteenth uh, symposium. Thank you. It turns out I was muted. Yeah. So I was singing your praises and you didn't hear any of it. Well, you know, I'm sure it was great. I'm sure it was great. Okay. Well, I have a, a layman's uh, naive question. Now, could artificial intelligence be used to predict uh, which universe uh, a user uh, resides in when you're trying to speed up the loading of a page? That's a great question. That sounds like a startup. Hey, let's go do it. Okay, everyone on this uh, Zoom call can be investors. So the answer is, is yes, but the tricky thing is how long would it take the algorithm to run? So, you know, when we're trying to optimize page load speeds, there's a question of if we're trying to make a prediction at the time that the load's taking place, then we want that prediction time to be low, right? Because otherwise, let's imagine in the extreme, we had a perfect prediction algorithm, like a perfect AI that took, let's say, five seconds to run to output that guess about which uh, universe should be needed. Well, because that algorithm would run so slowly, it sort of would outweigh any benefit that we'd get um, from that perfect prediction. So we do find that a lot of times in practice, um, you know, neural nets or things like that end up running too slow. Okay, so we can't start that company. Or maybe I'm just saying that so that nobody else tries to steal our ideas. Uh -huh. nudge, 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 nudge. <laughs> yeah, you get it. Tricky. Yeah. <laughs> So I see there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. Yeah, so we have one anonymous question for you, uh, Dr. Mickens. Um, this uh, attendee would like to know that you mentioned a philosophy class and they would like to know if you have any other advice for dealing with uh, grind culture, particularly at Michigan in terms of uh, overwork or just you know extreme academic standards. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So here's, here's one thing that I've seen both in academia and industry everywhere I go. Uh, almost no one uh, works uh, more than 50 hours a week, even during crunch time. Like there's, a, there's sort of a culture, I think, in engineering of work boasting where people say, oh, you know, I, I spent 60, 70 hours working last week. You cannot do that sustainably without burning out. And I think uh, in engineering, there is oftentimes this particular sort of like machismo where people feel like, oh, you know, the way that I show my worth is by putting in these long hours. But the thing is, is that if you work, you know, 60 hour weeks consistently, you'll get burned out. You won't be as creative. You'll start making mistakes. And it's just not good for your mental health. 
So I think the main thing that you should keep in mind is that kind of like how you don't always see people's failures, you only hear about the papers that got accepted. Um, it can be very difficult to actually see how many hours people are working. Uh, so you can't always take people at face value when they tell you, oh, I'm spending, you know, 60 hours doing this or 70 hours doing that. It's probably not true. So, you know, just take care of your health. It is true that sometimes you will have to do deadline pushes. That's one of the things I actually enjoy about engineering, you know, but I always tell my students, there's food, there's sleep, there's exercise. During a deadline push, most people can sacrifice at most one. And it's different for every person. So you got to know what that is about you uh, and then just make sure that you stay healthy. And we had one other one, a uh, sort of fun one from Avarda says um, that they admire your energy and tenacity and they would like to know how you develop so much swag. Ah, so much <laughs> swag. Well, uh, right, of course, of course. You know, you can't science good unless you feel that you're swagging good. Um, so I think for me, like when I was an undergrad and when I was, um, a graduate student, I would sometimes watch technical presentations where the technical content was super interesting, but like the way that it was presented was very boring. And I always thought it was kind of a shame because, you know, one of the things that makes me excited about science is sort of the, the humor about it or kind of like the, the whimsy of it. And so I would always tell myself, you know, little baby James, if I ever become a professor, if I, if I ever get to industry, then uh, I'm going to make sure all my presentations or at least have jokes that make me laugh, you know? And so that's what I try to do. Um, and so I really think that um, part of the, 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 the key to being a good engineer, I think, is having that sense of whimsy, is having that sense of um, sort of childlike curiosity and being able to poke fun at yourself. You know, I mean, I don't think anybody likes to hang out with a very gruff engineer who thinks they're right all the time. So, you know, I just encourage people to, you know, try to have fun, you know, and, it's, and that's imp particularly important to keep in mind when things aren't going well, um, because it's, it's a grind, you know, there'll be ups and there'll be downs. Um, but I think if you have that support system, if you have that sense of humor, if you can poke fun at yourself and at others, then I think it'll, it'll really help out your career and your mental health. Great, excellent advice. Now, um, you know, lately in the news, there was talk about, I think a Google employee happened to say that there was a sentient AI thing over there in Google land. And it was immediately uh, <laughs> uh, rejected you know, by Google. So what are the prospects that one could have sentient AI someday? Well, I, I mean, I think uh, it might get sentient enough to be problematic for us. I remember when I was a kid, I would watch, my dad would always take me to these uh, sci-fi movies and I'd watch this stuff and I'm like, this could be an envisionable future, you know? And I said, I got to watch out for this stuff. Now, I think the particular AI that was in the news recently, I don't think that it's sentient, right? If you actually look at the sort of conversations that it's having over the scope of the entire conversation, you can tell that it's sort of not keeping up with all the narrative threads and so on and so forth. But that being said, you know, I think at a higher level, it is very important for engineers to think about, um, you know, how they, how their engineering systems are situated in larger contexts, right? Like the thing that I'm not worried about with respect to AI in the near term, it's not that it's going to become sentient and launch nuclear missiles. It's that, for example, it'll be trained using biased data, and that will lead to differentially worse outcomes for uh, marginalized groups, for example. And like we've seen this with, you know, facial recognition or software that's being used to um, determine sentencing in, in court trials, right? So there the problem is not somehow that the AI has achieved some general level of intelligence. The problem is that it got trained on biased data. It therefore emits classifications that perpetuate pre-existing biases. That's what I think the immediate harm is with AI. Yeah, that's a very serious problem. Yeah, especially for communities of color. Yep. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much. Now, uh, there'll be ample time for more questions at the very end. And so thank you, Professor Mickens, for this wonderful, wonderful talk. Yeah, thank I'd you. I'd love to be one of your students sitting in your class at, at Harvard. I've got openings in my lab. We're always looking for new help. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, our next speaker is Dr. Donnell Walton.
Dr. Walton graduated from North Carolina State University with degrees in physics and electrical engineering. He then came to Michigan and earned his PhD in applied physics. And I was fortunate that he chose me as his thesis advisor uh, for Donnell is an absolutely brilliant scholar. And I probably learned as much from him as he did from me. After Michigan, he spent three years on the faculty of Howard University, during which time he set up a fiber laser research facility and earned a prestigious NSF career award. He then joined Corning Research Lab in Corning, New York in 1999. At Corning, he established the company as a world leader in high power kilowatt level fiber lasers and became the manager of worldwide applications for Gorilla Glass helping to grow revenue from 20 million to over a billion. In 2016, he was appointed director of the Corning Technology Center, Silicon Valley. In 2021, he was awarded the ECE Willie Hobbs Moore Distinguished Alumni Lectureship by the University of Michigan. So it's only appropriate today that Dr. Walton will be talking about the life and times of Willie Hobbs Moore. This year marks 50 years since Willie Hobbs Moore became the first African-American woman to earn a PhD in physics anywhere in this country. And he did that right here at the University of Michigan. So Willie Hobbs Moore was a pioneer. Now, Dr. Walton actually knew Willie Hobbs Moore. And so today he will share his, uh, his interactions with Dr. Moore and tell us a bit more about her life and times. Dr. Walton, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Herb, um, for the invitation, for the gracious introduction and the opportunity to interact with uh, great people like Angelique and a wonderful talk from James, and I'm sure it's gonna be a wonderful talk from Todd as well. Um, yeah, so James, I didn't get the latitude you got. Herb said I can talk about anything as long as it's Willie Hobbs more. So I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to do that. So I'll start by saying that, um, yeah, so as Herbert mentioned, I, I started my career at, um, well, I've been at Corning for 20 years or over 20 years, but I started my career at Howard. And when I was at Howard, um, I made a lot of uh, good friends and uh, had a lot of good um, mentors. And one of the most important, or two, two of them were the uh, the uh, two of them were the associate provosts, uh, Dr. Don Coleman and Dr. O. Jackson Cole. And Don Coleman, and they, and they were both uh, Michigan alums. One uh, Coleman was a computer science, and uh, Dr. Uh, Cole was a uh, sociologist. And I'll actually come back to that. But now I'd like to talk about Dr. Uh, Hobbs Moore. Uh, so uh, what we did, and last year at, at Juneteenth, I gave uh, some reflections about uh, Dr. Moore, Hobbs Moore, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. So, but then I'm going to shift gear. So uh, Dr. Hobbs Moore, you know, she came to the University of Michigan um, from Atlantic City. She hopped on a train in 1954, uh, coincidentally the same year as the uh, historic Brown versus Board Supreme Court case, and she uh, went on to be the uh, only Black woman in the School of Engineering and got her electrical engineering de bachelor's degree in 1958, went on to get her master's degree in 1961. And then she did some work and then she came back and completed her PhD in physics in 1972. So my third year grad school, I met the paternal unit of our previous speaker, uh, Ron Mickens. He came to the University of Michigan. He was a professor at Clark Atlanta University. And he gave a talk on the nonlinear dynamics of renal function. But after the talk, we went to dinner and he uh, gave us kind of a brief history lesson about the first African-American to get a PhD in any field in the United States was Edward Boucher. And that field happened to be physics and from Yale University in 1876. But then he talked about the historic impact the University of Michigan had in the history of uh, Blacks in physics. For example, in 1918, the same year that Dr. Boucher passed, uh, Elmer Imes became the second 
uh, Black American to get a, a PhD in physics, and that was from the University of Michigan. And also, 1972, Dr. Uh, Hobbsmore became the first Black woman to get a PhD in physics. And that was interesting because he said that, um, more importantly, so this is a picture of Dr. Elmer Imes, and this is a picture of uh, Dr. Hobbsmore when the year she graduated. But more importantly, he said that uh, she still lived, to his knowledge, in the Ann Arbor community, and you know she may be there to to, to meet. So I was very excited about this. And at the time, <clears throat> I was um, volunteering at the Saturday African American Academy that was held at Clegg Middle School and organized by Bill Ratcliffe, who not only was a pillar in the African American uh, community in Ann Arbor, but he also went to the University of Michigan during the '50s. So I figured he'd have a good chance of having of, of knowing Dr. Hobsmore. So I went to him that Saturday and I asked him that he did, was he aware of Dr. Hobsmore? And he said, yeah, I'm not aware of it. She's sitting right over there. So uh, she had been, she and I had been working at the same uh, program for the past year. I never knew her, never knew of her existence until Dr. Mickens, Dr. Mickens, the elder, Ron told me about her. So I went over to her and introduced myself and, you know, we, uh, you know, after some initial friction, <laughs> you know, she she didn't have time for me. She was very busy tutoring, uh, you know, doing her doing her job at the at the time. But then she came up. She introduced herself to me again, and then we became you know pretty close. We went to brunch uh, many uh, many Saturdays, and she talked about her background. How, you know, where she worked at Bendix and Barnes and Sensor Dynamics, and um, how she went back to the University of Michigan to get her PhD, worked at KMS, and then you know, the work that she was doing there at Ford. Um, at that time, she was an executive in the warranty department. Um, but her the, the, the themes of our talks would basically cover three areas. Uh, we talked about research, you know, kind of cutting edge research. I talked about the work that I was doing with her um, and uh, about the, the, um, mainly optics. Her background was, um, she did uh, some very nice modeling and, and, and Raman spectroscopy. Um, we talked about STEM teaching. We, we shared a, a passion for preparing the next generation of uh, African Americans and, 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 and uh, students of color to, to, to do STEM and to excel in STEM. And we talked about physics history, for example. Um, you know, I, you know, we were talking about how do we um, improve the numbers, and something I think we'll talk about more today um, in, of uh, African Americans and in, in, in physics, uh, in particular, but but in science in, in general. And she went on to give me the perspective that, you know, in the, in the 60s, for example, Princeton University and University of Michigan were among the top producers of black PhDs in physics, which was, I had, I had no idea. So that was very interesting. So around that same time, I uh, was uh, asked to organize a national conference of black physics students in uh, Washington, DC in uh, 1995. And um, we had created as part of this, the inaugural Edward Boucher Award um, to recognize pioneers. That term comes up a lot in, in physics. And she was uh, we, we were gonna be one of the honorees, one of the recipients. And I asked, would she be interested? And I was, I was, to me, it was like giving a gift back to the community because she had not been a part of this uh, community where I met people like uh, Dr. Mickens and, and, and many others. And she was very happy to uh, participate. So, and I, and I was very happy to kind of invite her back in. <clears throat> But uh, uh, but all of a sudden, you know, our, our we stopped uh, having our brunches, and, and and I didn't see her coming to the uh, Saudi Academy anymore, and I was concerned, but you know, also very, uh, you know, also trying to graduate myself too, and then, and but what I didn't know that is that uh, Dr. Hopsmore had been a uh, um, um, she had succumbed to cancer um, during some during the during the time that I was there. She had uh, been diagnosed, matter of fact, the same year that she conferred her PhD in 1972 and, and been living with that as she did everything else that she did. Um, so uh, so that was kind of a, you know, an, an, an interesting ending or so I thought at the time. So last year, as I mentioned, uh, Herbert invited me to give, uh, to, to, to give some reflections of, 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 uh, of, uh, of my knowing uh, Willie Hobbs Moore and some of her history at, at, this, at this event, at this Juneteenth event. And then, after that, he uh, he uh, and he also, as he mentioned, he invited me to uh, give the uh, Willie Hobbs Moore uh, uh, Distinguished Lectureship back in November. 
So everything I'm going to talk about now has happened since the, uh, the last time I talked about her at, at Juneteenth. So after giving the talk in June, uh, on Juneteenth and then giving this lecture, I think James uh, kind of told his father that I had done that and, and uh, Ron Mickens, and he was also working on a Physics Today article to commemorate Willie Hobbs Moore's 50th uh, anniversary of conferring her PhD. So Ron contacted me and asked me a couple of questions about uh, Dr. Hobbs Moore that I didn't know the answers to. Yeah, he asked, um, how did she choose Michigan? And he also asked, you know, why did she leave Ford? And I didn't really know the answers to those, but I do know that at the Juneteenth meeting last year, uh, Dr. Hausmore's daughter, uh, Dorian, attended and she sent everyone a chat saying that, hey, you know, I'm, I'm here and I'm, you know, happy that you guys honored my, my mom. Um, yeah, and I'm glad that you honored her mom. And I was like, and I sent her a chat back and I said, hey, Dorian, this is Donnell, you know, reach out to me, you know, let's, let's, let's get in contact. She didn't respond. Just like her mom, you know, when I first met her, she didn't talk to me. So I was like, okay, cool. So Ron was like, how can I find out the answer to these questions? I said, well, I'm not going to contact Dorian because she doesn't she doesn't get back with people. So I went back to uh, Bill Ratcliffe, who how I met her in the first place, and asked him because he didn't know the answers to these questions. So I was like, Ugh, I guess I have to go back to Dorian. I'm laughing because Dorian's here again today. And uh, so I reached back out to Dorian, and. Um, this time, to my surprise, she did reply. And it turned out that she had replied before. She just didn't have the right email. And she gave me the answers to those questions, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But uh, more importantly, this was December of last year, which was a you know, uh, tough time, right? I mean, I was, you know, we're still on lockdown. And uh, I got a, a text from her telling her I wanted to talk to her about these questions that Ron had asked me. And then she sent me this text, which you can't really see. It's pretty small, I think. But she said to me, and this is something that I had no idea, and this is uh, 94, I, you know, she said uh, that, uh, that did, you, did you know my mom referred to you as our brother? And, and by our, she meant uh, her, Dorian, and, and uh, Willie's um, son, Christopher. When she was talking to us, she worked with and mentored a lot of people, but I hope you know that she really trusted and she loved you. And I was just completely uh, flummoxed by this. I hadn't, you know, because again, remember, I'd, you know, she, I, I, her, our relationship kind of ended abruptly because of her sickness, which I was unaware of. And it just started everything over, which was just absolutely amazing. And this, again, many years, you know, 28 years after her passing, she became an important force in my life once again. So um, I got some of the answers back to Ron and Ron said, hey, you know what? We should, in addition to writing this Physics Today article, we should do a symposium. And I found out that he is, uh, as whimsical as his son is, by we he met, I should organize a symposium, which I appreciated. So, and I was able to do that. Um, we did a we did a symposium to honor Dr. Uh, Willie Hobbs Moore at the uh, March meeting of the American Physical Society, and and the way I organized it is that I told you the themes that we discussed were kind of history of physics or blacks in physics, uh, STEM education, and research. So I chose three exemplars of this. Uh, Dr. Jamie uh, Valentine Miller is a patent examiner, examiner for the U.S. Patent Office, but she's also a, uh, the founder of the uh, African-American Women in Physics organization. So she gave a history of the uh, 100 or so, uh, P or a summary of the 100 or so uh, Black women who've uh, conferred PhDs in physics and physics-related areas since Dr. Hobbs Moore. Dr. Josita Jones is a professor at NYU, and she spends a lot of time and efforts uh, educating black and brown students and getting them prepared for um, for uh, careers in STEM. And uh, she does a lot of that by uh, funding it out of, out of her own pocket. And to discuss the uh, research, uh, I, 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 I invited uh, Dr. Nadia Mason, who's a professor at um, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She does work on uh, superconductivity in um, in, in, in uh, novel materials, and she's you know she's a fellow of the American Physical Society. She was just inducted this year into the National Academy of Sciences. Just uh, a force to be reckoned with. So it was an outstanding symposium. It was great, and it was all in the honor of Dr. Hobson. When it was it was fun for me to uh, pull that together. So I will close with uh, kind of three comments. Um, uh, the, the the first one was you know. Um, you know, I heard about Juneteenth, you know, many, many years ago, uh, 
uh, I moved from Michigan growing up to, to the South. So, and it's more prevalent in the South, I guess it's probably one over our uh, <laughs> uh, relationship to the uh, distance from Texas. So I was closer to Texas. So we learned, it. but I, I was never really a big fan of it. I mean, it's kind of like a celebration of, you know, our being gaslit, uh, you know, there, there are a quarter of a million blacks who uh, remain enslaved two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. So I never really uh, thought of it, you know, in a, in a particularly positive light. But, you know, thinking about what's happened now and reframing Juneteenth as an opportunity for an event like this, where, 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 where we can interact and think about these things and, and, and honor Dr. Hobbs more and, and get a chance to interact with uh, James and Angelique and Todd by, by Herb's organization is, is, makes me kind of reframe, you know, kind of what the meaning of, of, of Juneteenth can, can really be. Um, and it, 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 it actually afforded me this opportunity to kind of revisit my relationship with, uh, with um, Dr. Hopsmore and, 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 and develop uh, relationships, you know, a deeper relationship with, 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 with her family and particularly uh, uh, Doreen. So um, the, the other one I, I think is that I mentioned earlier when I went to Howard, you know, I had mentorship from Don Coleman and O. Jackson Cole. When I when we did the symposium, I posted it on the uh, uh, on LinkedIn, and Don Coleman again. I, I'm not sure if you can see this, but Don Coleman replied. I hadn't heard from him in many years, and he actually talked about how uh, I didn't even know he he knew Willie Hobbs more, but he said that she not only did he know her and was fascinated and impressed with her because they were undergrads at the same time. He was two years young, uh, uh, younger than she was, but he talked about the the times in which she tutored him and how she, the way she tutored people was that um, she would actually, whatever the electrical engineering class was, she'd always go right back to first principles. And instead of making it feel like he was, she was introducing him to something that he never understood before, she explained it to him in a way that he knew it before he always knew and he just wasn't aware that he knew it, which was just an amazing engagement from, uh, from someone who I, you know, that I, that had bet so much to me and I had no idea that they had been connected and, and she had meant so much to him as well. And um, that's the second thing. So Juneteenth kind of predicated those. And the third thing I will say is go blue. Um, Michigan has a, a fantastic history. A lot of times we, 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 we shouldn't actually give it up to anyone else other than us. I, 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 I'll close with an anecdote. I have a, a good friend who, uh, when I was finishing up my thesis, he came into Michigan, he was being recruited uh, to go there for grad school. And he asked me the question. He said, did I get what I needed from the University of Michigan? Right? He's, um, and I said, yes, I got what I needed from the University of Michigan. But I'm not telling you that it was given to me, but I am telling you that it was there for the taking. So that's an uh, amazing legacy Michigan has and continues to have. So go blue. That's my, uh, those are my comments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Donnell. That was uh... A wonderful, wonderful presentation of Willie Hobbs Moore, Life and Times, and of your interactions with her. You know, when you're talking about how you learned that she costed you her son, you know, it actually brought tears to my eyes, you know, how uh, she had that kind of uh, empathy with you. So that's, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I have maybe one question. Do you have any idea how Willie Hobbs Moore became interested in engineering? You know, what led her yes. to on this path? Right. Yeah. So you know, as a, she's a, she's a brilliant student growing up in Atlantic City, and um, but as most brilliant black girls then. They, they were, she was being advised by her teachers and counselors and everything that she should pursue something like nursing or teaching or something like that. But uh, per, per, per her daughter, she interacted with someone who was, had an engineering background, but not just that while, while she was in school, not just that, but this person was uh, an alumnus of the University of Michigan. And he told her about Michigan and he told her about, you know, thinking about electrical engineering and she was able to become exposed to this as an opportunity for her, where in, in an environment where people like her were being kind of pushed to, you know, traditional, I'll say, fields. So uh, uh, so the, the short answer is a Michigan alumnus 
took gave her the gave her planted the seed in her mind and her tenacity and you know uh, superhuman abilities uh got her got her on a train and to michigan to pursue it wow so really go blue that you know, uh, alumni are such a amazing resource uh, worldwide yeah so are there any questions in the chat for dr walton not so far. Um, uh, Catherine did just post a link to a full story on Dr. Walton, though, and he talks a little bit more about Willie Hobbs Moore, and you can see the full um, uh, distinguished lectureship um, that he gives about uh, Willie Hobbs Moore's uh, life and career um, there as well, if anyone is interested. Mm -hmm. Also, do you know why she switched from engineering to, to physics? Yeah, so um, so that came out of the interaction with Don Coleman again a few months ago. I asked him that question. Hey, you knew her, and he said the way she taught things always from first principle. He had no, he was not surprised at all that she would go from engineering to physics because she just was kind of gravitated toward the uh, toward fundamentals, toward, towards first principles. That was kind of his perspective. Yeah, and 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 uh, and and it was definitely. I mean, she had a firm grasp of engineering, and when we were when she always. Uh, deconstruct my my arguments when we talk, but it was her kind of fundamental. She'd always kind of boil back to. So I, I, that would be that that would be my interpretation of why she did it. Mm -hmm. And when she worked in industry, did she do any physics research? No, it was mostly engineering. Uh, right. So to my knowledge, no. I mean, to my knowledge, she did research. At Michigan, you know, at Michigan, after she finished her PhD, she was there as kind of like a research uh, scientist for five years. She published a lot of papers on Raman for protein spectroscopy, but then Ford um, hired her as a basically a an engineer. I mean, she was she was an assembly engineer, and you know, just but but to, I'm not I am not aware of any research that she did while she was at Ford, other than kind of the um, not physics research per se, but using physics, re, you know, empirical methods to translate the, um, the Japanese, uh, using kind of um, scientific pedagogy to, to translate the, the, the Japanese uh, uh, quality uh, um, practices to, uh, to, to, to English and, and, and implement them at Ford, but not like kind of lab work. I see, great, all right. Well, uh, let's see. There's one question in Q and A. Yeah, we have uh, <laughs> what Lisa asked. <laughs> <laughs> what physics? Uh, asked, uh, why did you abandon optics for management, and how did you transition from the lab to the director's office? <laughs> so, so Dr. Musa and Gom asked that question, and he's being a a smart aleck, as 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 most people call. It. So he's actually coming to our lab sometime this summer to do some optics research. And um, I kind of I would say that I with, with some of our equipment here and bringing some of them pursue some of his ideas. Um, so I, I I would say that to be able to enable things like that to do more things than I can do with my own decrepit hands is why. Um, but uh, but I I still I'll never stop loving uh, optics and physics. And but but enabling it is is, is uh, something that I enjoy doing as well. Well, good. Once an optiker, always an optiker. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm still a student of color, as though as though I, I study color. <laughs> go 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 four eighty nanometers. Yeah. Okay. So um, our last presentation by uh, Dr. Professor Todd Coleman. Uh, hello, everyone. Can people, oh, okay. can people hear me? Yeah, so let me give you give a brief introduction now that I know you're here live yeah, yes. and in person. Yes, I'm wearing my A squared shirt underneath here, by the way. <laughs> <Go Wonderful. live>. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Dr. Todd Coleman graduated from the University of Michigan with bachelor's degrees in electrical engineering and computer engineering in 2000. Actually, I proud of the fact that I actually taught him when he was an undergrad. I taught him electromagnetics, and I knew he was going to be a superstar someday. 
Well, he then went on and received his PhD from MIT in 2005, then did a one year postdoc at the Mass General Hospital, during which time he began to apply his electrical engineering skills to biological and biomedical problems. He has served on the faculty in the departments of bioengineering and electrical engineering at the University of Illinois, at the University of California, San Diego, and then, then since 2021 at Stanford University, where he's an associate professor of bioengineering and of electrical engineering. He has done groundbreaking work in bioengineering, including advances in wearable electronics to the connection between the gut and the brain. So I mean, when someone says, I have this gut feeling, implying that there's some intelligence residing in the gut, perhaps we should take it literally. Todd Coleman's latest research is showing that there is a definite connection between the stomach and the brain. So Todd, over to you. Uh, thanks so much. And I believe that uh, your staff is going to uh, uh, play the video. Uh, my apologies, I have a sick child that I'm uh, running between appointments. Uh, but um, <clears throat> yeah, before the video was played, I'd just like to say, not only did I take class with, <clears throat> Uh, with Professor Winful, but I also did a little bit of electromagnetic research with him, which I still wonder to this day why did MIT so me for graduate school? I think it was in part also that I experienced doing research with Professor Winful. And uh, I also like to comment that the last name Coleman appeared a lot in the previous talk. To the best of my knowledge, Don Coleman and I are not related, but I'm going to do some homework on this and I'm going to talk to my uncle, who's the patriarch of our family, to, uh, to hunt that down. And I'm going to try to get in touch with Don myself. And who knows, maybe we are distant cousins. Uh, so with that, if uh, Catherine or someone can play the video, then I'll be happy to take Q&A afterwards. Okay, uh, go blue, everyone. So I thought I'd start off and tell you a little bit about myself. After I graduated from Michigan, I went to MIT for grad school, working under Muriel Medard. Learned a lot about applied probability and information theory. I uh, then went on to do a postdoctoral study in neuroscience after my PhD, after strong suggestions by my advisor to do something wildly different. And I worked with Emery Brown, who is a uh, anesthesiologist, neuroscientist, and a statistician. So at this point, I knew I was on my way to the University of Illinois or Banner Champaign. And I was doing a, po a pit stop to do some neuroscience. And while I was just a professor, I, uh, I picked up some skills in technology development. So some of the things our research group has been involved in include <clears throat> topics such as um, from a pure analytics perspective, developing um, optimal maps of transform samples from one distribution to another. Uh, important, importantly relevant uh, with high dimensional data. Uh, in addition, uh, we've been involved with uh, technology development, building thin, uh, flexible, stretchable sensors. And lastly, operating at the intersection of all three in sort of neuroscience technology analytics with applications to sleep staging, uh, using a patch on the forehead. So um, the same year that I moved from UC San Diego to, sorry, sorry, from Illinois to UC San Diego, I lost my dad to pancreatic cancer. Here's a picture of us together here. And it turns out that he had lost his mom's stomach cancer. And so I thought there was some symbolism on um, his passing and the timing of it being when I was moving to a new position. So I told myself, even though I know nothing about the digestive system, I'm going to start to learn. So uh, one of the things that we found that's interesting is that, um, you know, the, these common symptoms like uh, pain, nausea, bloating uh, <clears throat> can, per, can ultimately be related to one of many, many of these different diseases. And what's interesting about these diseases is they have different treatments. This sort of guess and check framework uh, is part of the reason that it costs about 150 billion U.S. Uh, dollars in, in annual cost. So as we start to understand things more, I said, hey, I'm an electrical engineer, I became a neuroscientist. Uh, how can I play a role in the digestive system? Well, when the digestive system has uh, chemistry and whatnot, think about the acids in your stomach. The digestive system is also pushing on food, so it's mechanical. What is the connection with electrical activity? Well, it turns out we have pacemaker cells in our digestive system, and they're connected uh, electrically uh, to our brain. Um, via our uh, spinal cord and our vagus nerve. So this 
uh, electrical connection between the gut and the brain is something that we got very excited about. <clears throat> so the pacemaker cells of the stomach that I uh, alluded to before basically have this property that they are they have oscillations and it actually is a propagating wave. So imagine each one of these little dots right here is a different pacemaker cell in the stomach and they're all oscillating at the same frequency individually, but more importantly, the phase offsets relative to one another, each other uh, constitute a traveling wave propagating from the top of the stomach down to the bottom. And uh, this effect um, got us interested in wondering, well, we know this is what occurs. What if we tried to measure this information non-invasively analogous to how an EEG does that for the brain or an EKG does that for the heart? So <clears throat> we took an attempt at doing that and start to build multi-electrode arrays to capture this information. Uh, with these multi-electrode arrays, we actually are able to, uh, if we filter the frequency of these pacemaker cells, which is very low frequency, about 0 0.05 hertz, then we can actually pick up information like this traveling wave. And then me as an applied probability person, uh, if you look at the raw sort of voltages uh, across three different waveforms uh, associated or electrodes associated with different colors, what you start to see is something that constitutes a traveling wave. And we can figure out the direction of that using standard work like the average uh, you know, angle associated with the, um, the gradient of the phase. And with that, uh, we can then start to build spatial histograms for every human subject to take a look at when there are traveling waves occurring, what direction are they propagating? And uh, one of the things that, that was interesting is uh, what we found was that um, in the controls, uh, the, all the statistically significant wave activity was always propagating towards the small intestines. Whereas in patients with diagnosed delayed gastric emptying called gastroparesis, Notice that the patterns are very different. And here, the small intestines are still about 180 degrees and get their pumping food every direction but that way. We're able to go one step further and to show that this um, aberrant or this abnormal electrical activity, as you saw on the right on the previous slide, actually correlates with the severity of symptoms. So if you take a look at these stars, these represent control subjects. The y-axis here is a clinically indicated symptom severity score that goes ultimately between zero and five. And what we find is that all of the stars in the bottom left uh, correspond to healthy controls. So their symptom severity is low, but also the percentage of abnormal slow waves is small. And it, uh, there's a nice correlation that takes place um, between them more generally. <clears throat> So one of the things that my graduate student, uh, former graduate student Anjali uh, got interested in doing is being able to go um, uh, beyond just showing correlation with symptoms, but can we actually perform treatment response? And in order to do this, she had to develop a lot of fun mathematics of uh, doing clustering, uh, doing a variety of media detection and other techniques operating upon um, <clears throat> this unique type of data set. So the high level idea was to be able to separate things to pinpoint uh, etiologies. And one of the things that was very exciting is, this is a similar plot to what I showed you before, but what we took advantage of was that our clinical collaborator sometimes uh, did repeated uh, assessments on patients um, uh, before and after an intervention was done. And so what you notice is that, uh, we basically have a plot, which is a linear transformation of the features, you know, associated with what I alluded to before, the y-axis is still the symptom severity score. <clears throat> Many patients, <clears throat> symptom severity is consistent with what we would have predicted from the data. But in some of the patients, the symptom severity is a lot higher. That suggests for these patients uh, that uh, giving them uh, a treatment uh, that tries to involve and train the slow waves is not really gonna matter because their slow wave activity is not the issue. So what was fascinating is indeed we found that um, when uh, my colleague actually gave uh, these patients um, you know, a, a second test and meanwhile had given them a medication, their severity not only got better, but it got closer to fitting this line. Uh, something else that we got interested in doing is um, going beyond simply um, just using this $30,000 uh, EEG system and actually taking advantage of the brain initiative that took place around 2010 and leveraging the portable technologies that have been developed by companies like Texas Instruments and whatnot. And so this is just one example of a portable, portable device that we use 
And we were able to capture a lot of interesting information. We were able to implement artifact rejection algorithms, filtering, do spectral analyses. Remember I mentioned 0 0.05 Hertz is the frequency of interest for the stomach. Identify events of interest, build a event logging app to go along with it. And we can take a look at things such as when meals occur. We know a meal usually takes about four, four hours to, uh, to clear off the subject. We can take a look at the power of the gastric signal and see to what extent uh, that is taking place. Uh, in addition, we can actually look at spatial information associated with um, when patients uh, have symptoms. Are those symptoms associated with spatial electrical abnormalities? That is a key question that a clinical colleague wants to know because it affects how he treats patients. <clears throat> uh, we went one step further to actually build the extend peel and stick stretchable arrays like I showed on my first slide. And so we demonstrated this in 2021. And we were actually able to image the uh, antrum of the stomach to pinpoint where we uh, are placing the electrodes using this $2,000 butterfly network system that can be plugged into any iPhone or iPad. We were able to do that. And what these results show is that after a meal, you see this increase in the normalized power as expected. And um, we basically consistently always see 0 0.05 hertz dominant frequency. Excuse me. In the area under the curve for how much energy is in the signal increases after meal as before meal in all patients. So in the spirit of uh, Wayne Gretzky uh, saying, uh, uh, I don't skate towards where the puck is, I skate to where the puck is going. In that regard, when we uh, moved to this new building at Stanford University in uh, June 2021, I asked myself, I've been working on this GI stuff for the last 10 years. What's my next move? And I remembered, well, hey, the gut and the brain are connected to one another. As I mentioned before, what if we actually simultaneously record electrical activity from both? And so we have begun to do that. And the high level idea is that these two systems are coupled. And it turns out that the stomach and the brain are coupled. This has recently been shown. The stomach generates a very low frequency signal, 0 0.05 Hertz. If we take a look at the alpha band uh, of the EEG, then what we find is that these two things indeed are coupled. And so this gives rise to phase amplitude coupling where the phase of the slow signal actually modulates the amplitude of the faster signal. And we develop some tests uh, within the context of attention and emotion and memory processing and whatnot. And basically a couple of interesting things that we found. Uh, first of all, is that, uh, that basically the degree of phase amplitude coupling uh, correlates with behavioral performance. And we are in a working memory task. It actually is a, it, the slope of that curve is much, much higher, further indicative as such. So this is just the very beginning and we have a lot of ongoing studies that we'll be moving in the future. And I hope this gives a sense of our lab. And so uh, I can conclude with talking about red ocean, blue ocean. Red ocean is where you operate in existing areas. Uh, it taints the, the ocean bloody red. And on the flip side, if you can identify fun, exciting areas that are vastly underexplored, then this creates a blue ocean opportunity. Uh, and I thought I would um, just lastly talk about you know, an endeavor that I've been interested, I've gotten involved in since 2021 with Professor Wilfred Gangbo at UCLA and Jelani Nelson at UC Berkeley. So three uh, black California faculty who developed a, a program in the, in the honor of uh, David Blackwell, who was the first uh, African-American to be elected to the National Academy of Sciences and the idea is to try to increase the, the very low numbers in mathematics PhD programs of Blacks, 3%, as well as engineering, 4%. And the idea is to have deep, uh, intimate mentorship where we work, uh, each of us works with one or two students. Over the summer, we directly work with them, directly engage with them, get involved in uh, ideally writing papers uh, by the time they graduate, and ultimately putting them in a great position, not only to be um, prepared to succeed, but to also have the confidence to do so. And uh, this summer, my student is uh, Taku uh, Guru, uh, who's a double major in computer science and statistics at University uh, University of uh, Amherst. Uh, and um, with that, I conclude my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Todd. Uh, you've given us a lot to digest uh, today. Get it, get it. <laughs> uh, we don't have much time now. We're, so I'm going to skip the individual Q&A for you because uh, we'd like to bring the panel together because we're going to only have maybe five minutes for the panel discussion uh, before we bring in 
the other uh, things scheduled before we end at one o'clock. So um, let's get the panel together for a very brief, very brief panel discussion. Okay, so I'll just lead with a question. Uh, why is it that there are so few black folk in science and engineering? Do you have any insights into the problem? And what can we do about increasing the numbers? Ooh, I might go first. I have to log off after this question, but I love this one. Um, I think it's very challenging to answer this, but I think it starts from removing um, the inherent definition of what engineering and STEM is. Um, a lot of Black people are creatives. And somehow in the developmental process in terms of kindergarten, middle school, high school, there became this thing that engineering was purely math. And if you were good at math, you should be an engineer. When engineering is really about being creative, it's about design. Most engineers I know, uh, particularly Black engineers, are skilled in some other art form. Um, as we learned today. And so I think it starts by, by not confining engineering to a narrow definition. And then also on the school system side growing up, not having other people relegate certain skill sets based on the skin of your color, uh, color of your skin, saying that, hey, you, engineering might not be for you because students are discouraged from going into engineering because unfortunately there's still racism um, that exists. But then there's a systemic racism as well um, that ends up having a lot of our youth in school systems that are not equipped to adequately teach engineering in a fun, exciting, and inviting way, you know, using Lego robotics and things that other school systems have access to. So I think that there are a lot more Black people that um, are skilled in engineering, would love to go into engineering, but I think in the early process, they're just either discouraged or they're really mistold about what engineering is, because I run into engineers all the time um, and I say, hey, you own a gym, but I can sell from the way you think, wow, you're an engineer, right? But they just, no one ever exposed that to them. And so they became a personal trainer, um, but they do engineering as a personal trainer. It's, it's, you can see it in the way that they think. So I think it really starts at the young age um, in that way. Great, those are some very good points. Let's get them early. Uh, who wants to go next? This is Todd here. I'll make a very brief point because I know we're limited for time. I just want to make a comment that, uh, UCS alum by the name of Leon Pryor is doing some really exciting work in Detroit. So keep your eyes on him. Leon Pryor, he's an ECS uh, degree holder. Um, he's in Detroit. Uh, he has a son. He's got him excited in robotics. And he does all this stuff in Detroit with robotics. And they're winning like these huge competitions. I just saw something on LinkedIn. And this directly relates to the previous point about uh, it's all about what we get, you know, our students excited about at a young age to get them passionate, a sense of competition, you know, mirroring the principles from athletics and whatnot and these other situations. So I would definitely encourage the department to be aware of what he's doing at some point getting him to campus because it's awesome. Uh, I don't have anything else to add much outside of what was said previously, except that I think we also, our community, Black folk ourselves, need to, hold, hold, need to also hold ourselves accountable and what we um, what we find to be important, you know, as Biggie Small said at one point, either you're slinging crack rock or you got a wicked jump shot. And so some of these things come from our own principles about what we think is important, entertainment, you know, sports, etc. Uh, there is some change that I'm very excited about. If people may remember in the summer of 2020, uh, Pharrell, the artist, had a song with Jay-Z about black entrepreneurs. And at a midpoint in the song, he highlighted the first black valedictorian at Princeton, Nicholas Johnson, and he was in the video. And that's an example of taking black excellence from, um, uh, you know, from entertainment that is well established and well known and highlighting the future of how we want to see black people evolve, which is along the lines of what we're talking about. So that's an instance. And so I challenge not only the exterior, but also us ourselves to continue to do that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So let's now. Professor Winfield, we did have one question in the QA box, and I thought this would be a good one to end on. Um, if we oh, are, unless well, we have another one to ask. <laughs> um, I wanted to also hear from James and Donnell because I'm sure they have some brilliant things to say about it. We'll limit those to maybe 
30 seconds or, and then we will get to the, uh, to that question in the Q&A. So Donnell, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, briefly at 30 seconds. So it's, it's more of a synopsis of what uh, Todd and Angelique said. I mean, every child uh, goes through a three-step process in choosing a career. They identify their interests, they identify what opportunities are available to them to pursue those interests, and they identify the potential rewards. And if we if we don't if they don't have an opportunity to see to be exposed to engineering, I didn't I didn't know anything about engineering until I was a junior, maybe a senior in high school. Never heard of it other than being uh, equating it to being a conductor of a train. Mm. Um, there's the only thing they do see is as Todd said, uh, <laughs> you know Christopher Wallace, aka Biggie Small. So we have to be able to expose them early on to see that this this is an opportunity for you to, as Angelique said, create and and uh, express yourselves in this new way. But without that exposure, you can't choose it. All right, James. Yeah, and I'll just, uh, I'll just add, I think that's particularly important for research oriented careers, because even a lot of students of color who think that engineering and science is a great thing to do, they don't know what research is. Like literally I will talk to freshmen who say, hey, I'm super excited about computer science or mechanical engineering or whatever. I said, well, have you thought about research? And they say, well, what, but what is that? You know, and I think once you talk to students and explain to them, it's the creation of new knowledge. You know, it's basically when you read books about how, you know, astronomy works or how computers work, how did that, where did that knowledge come from? It didn't just, you know, fall from the sky. Someone had to invent that stuff. I think that's very important. I think it's very important too to teach young students that, you know, sort of reality is that right now you may not be able to have as a student of color, all your mentors be of color, but that's okay. You know, in the sense, if you can find people who are willing to support you, you know, regardless of what color, what gender they are, that's really the key thing. I see sometimes students get locked up and that, you know, I don't have, you know, as many, uh, let's say, African-American professors as I would prefer. And that's definitely a problem. But that doesn't prevent you from finding uh, champions for you, regardless of where they are, and, and sort of working with them to try to, uh, you know, achieve your dreams. That's great. Yeah, so let, let's now... Take that just, one question. Yeah, just the one question, just a rapid fire answer. I think this could be a, a good, uh, you know, final thoughts. Uh, what is the main advice that you can give for a high school junior interested in engineering at U of M, aside from the fact that Professor Winfield cannot retire before 2027? <laughs> well, I think uh, getting, oh, I was just going to say, yeah, getting, getting Herb a great uh, healthcare plan is obviously number one on that list. Uh, the other thing I mentioned too, and this is one thing I think is very important for engineering students to hear, even in STEM fields, it's a social science. A lot depends on the people that you know who are in your professional network, who can sort of evangelize for you, who can guide you towards internships and stuff like that. So be sure to talk to people, professors, students, people in different departments. Uh, it's so important. Great. And Donnell, you were also going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to, I'm, I'm, I'm about four or five steps behind James. I'm catching up though. But I was just going to go back to amplify his previous point and say, get that junior and uh, research opportunity at Michigan so they can get on campus and, like, you know, and, and then recruit them to PhD early on. But yeah, get them an opportunity to see what, what's going on, what they like and what they don't like. Now, let's connect that junior to Leon Pryor doing the robotic stuff. <laughs> there you go. Right. Right. And I should mention that uh, Michigan just launched the first undergraduate robotics degree of any uh, research university in the U.S. So, are I'm those sure. robots self-aware, like the Google AI? Or? <laughs> They're in training, yeah, right now. <laughs> okay, so thank you. I'm I'm sorry we didn't have enough time to really expand on this wonderful conversation. And I, I hope we'll have an opportunity to do this and spend maybe an hour on this, uh, maybe the next uh, June team. Okay, so at this point, there are some other things. Let me get back to my uh, script for the event. Um, what do we do next? I was so caught up with this panel discussion. <laughs> okay, so, all right. Uh, at the end of each academic year, the two divisions of EECS each publish a report to provide transparency to our community regarding climate, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the department. Now we'll hear from department chairs, Mingyan Liu and Michael Wellman, who have recorded a message regarding these reports. 
Hi everyone, I am Mingyan Liu, Chair of Electrical and Computer Engineering. While we are saddened that we are unable to attend in person, we are pleased to be part of the EECS Juneteenth celebration. Today celebrates an important moment in history, and it also serves as a reminder of how far we have to go to achieve true equality for all. We know that an important part of equality is our opportunity and representation. We are committed to achieving greater diversity in the department and have been working hard toward this goal. As part of that process, we have been partnering with faculty and staff throughout the College of Engineering to ensure a community of inclusion and support for all our students. Our 2022 annual report on ECE's efforts and metrics, including Black students and faculty recruitment, retention, and placement is available online and we will put the link in the chat. ECE and CSE operate cooperatively but independently, so our report is just for ECE. I'll now let Professor Michael Wellman talk about CSE's document. Thank you, Mingyan. I'm Michael Wellman, Chair of Computer Science and Engineering. The Juneteenth celebration is an important way to help us recognize and reflect upon the challenges that Black individuals in our field still face and the steps we need to take as a community to affect change. The CSE DEI report is our way of documenting and learning from the work that our faculty, staff, and students have done over the past year to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is not just a record of past achievements, but an opportunity to assess and improve our efforts from year to year. Included in the report are detailed summaries of student enrollment and faculty recruiting data as well as summaries of CSE's new undergraduate mentorship program, our increased investment in recruiting activities at Michigan Community Colleges, and improvements to student experience in our intro level courses. Expanding these and other efforts is central to CSE's vision of the future. This report is publicly available on the CSE Climate and DEI website, and it is now being linked in the chat. Thank you again for attending and celebrating with us. And thank you to the students, alumni, and faculty who participated in the presentations. Thank you, EECS chairs, for the update. We also have a message now from the Graduate Society of Black Engineers and Scientists, Jess Bates. Okay, Asia. Thank you all for coming today and to further celebrate Juneteenth this year, Just Best, in partnership with a number of Black student organizations on campus, have put together the 2022 Freedom Festival. This festival will take place this Saturday, uh, June 18th, at Ferry Field between the times of 12 p.m. and 6 p.m. The event flyer can be found on the Just Best Instagram and Twitter accounts, and if you have any questions, feel free to email or DM us at jessbess or G-S-B-E-S -E underscore U-M-I-C-H. U -M -I -C -H. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asia, for that information. So this brings us to the end of our EECS Juneteenth celebration. I want to thank all the participants, all the panelists, all, everyone who worked to make this amazing event, you know, the staff, students, faculty, alumni, the entire University of Michigan community. So thank you. And please be sure to attend the other university-wide Juneteenth events that are going on uh, the next couple of days. And have a wonderful day. And see you all again next year.